Hey, Cypher here. Ever wonder why Western Europe came to dominate the world by the late 19th century? Numerous scholars have come to different answers, yet none have been conclusive. They're all flawed. I've already covered and disproven modernization theory, as in when Max Weber said that the ideology of the West was what made it great. Then Oriental Despotism, which is actually when Karl Marx was at his most racist. Continental Orientation, as in Jared Diamond's overly popular Guns, Germs, and Steel. And finally, Blout's Refutation of Them All. Some of those videos aren't too great because I made them a long time ago when I didn't know what I was doing, but I don't want to remake old videos just because they're boring. Today, I'm covering the first of these theories that has actual analytical adaptability, but it still has its flaws. Emanuel Wallerstein and other practitioners of world systems analysis gave an answer and a way to rationalize how the international economy functions. It's useful, but also so abstract that it may not be as reliable as scholars in the 1980s thought, as we shall see. The foundational idea of world systems analysis is that there is a global division of labor. The core is composed of mostly skilled workers who are at liberty to change employment, while the periphery has basic jobs that are unable to change. So the most powerful countries are those who dominate others through this labor system. There is also an in-between state or a semi-periphery, who are rising in power and portray a bit of both core and peripheral characteristics. This seemingly simplistic division of labor has an ability to morph to history, explaining the natural connection between imperialism and capitalism. World systems analysis is based on three key assumptions about history. First is that long periods of time can be divided into epochs with unifying characteristics. Second, leveraging the analytical skills of other disciplines can give a broader understanding of the world and its past. Third, that class exploitation defines each epoch. This is essentially a combination of the analysis school and Marxian materialism, which you can learn about both in my previous episodes on Western historiography. But world systems analysis inherently incorporates numerous schools of thought beyond those two basic ones. While he did not invent this novel form of analysis, Emanuel Wallerstein is the best known for it. Using that materialist analysis, Wallerstein argues that the reason for the West's rise as the hegemonic power of the world was because it was the first to adopt capitalism. Essentially, there were two previous economic systems that ruled the world. The first was defined by slaves creating the majority of wealth, basically referring to the classical world. That eventually turned to feudalism, as in the exploitation of serfdom to grow crops. Finally came capitalism, which its basis is city wage laborers, as in proletarians. But this isn't simply a blind repetition of Marxist historical progression. Wallerstein combines lots of economists and sociologists. For instance, he's just as reliant on Adam Smith as Marx, if not more so. Funny thing is, Marx actually liked Adam Smith and agreed with him in a lot of ways. People try to portray Marx as this antithesis to capitalism, but he's actually best understood as an analyst of capitalism. It's better to think of them as a continuity of economic thinkers, or as one book calls them, the worldly philosophers. It doesn't end with Marx either, you got like Thorstein Veblen and Keynes after that. Cutting yourself off from these thinkers, especially because, ooh, Marx is scary, is just plain ignorance. Wallerstein was combining a lot of this thought. The historical question he was trying to answer is, how did Europe adopt capitalism first? He argues that Europe went from a slave-based economy, then to feudalism, and finally capitalism. Slavery diminished on the continent as the Roman Empire broke apart into smaller and smaller aristocracies. 
they started uniting again to centralize power in each state in the late 16th century all the way into the early 18th century. As that happened, landowners began to fence off their territory, enclosing it and removing the peasants that had farmed there for centuries. This was the end of manorialism and the first inkling of capitalism. People flooded into cities and sought new wealth abroad in the colonies. As they traded, the imperial powers required merchants to trade in the home country first and used high tariffs to keep that commerce within their sphere of influence. Industry grew under the protection of this mercantilism, using raw goods to process into products, creating factories that were initially highly inefficient. This mercantilism is actually the primary thing Adam Smith argued against. By freeing up trade, after industries grew around their protectionist policies, these empires could control even more wealth. Factories became more and more efficient by having workers specialize in particular jobs and repeat them over and over. These two elements are what define capitalism for Wallerstein, as in free trade after mercantilism and industry becoming more efficient through the division of labor. With power secured by the process of centralization, imperialism, mercantilism, and eventually capitalism, Western Europe became the hegemonic power in the world able to assert their control over everyone else dividing the world into core and periphery to their benefit. World Systems Analysis argues this is how to interpret globalization of the market economy since Western Europe emerged as the most powerful place on Earth. But this theory doesn't stop there. Eastern Europe became the first semi-peripheral region through what Wallerstein called second serfdom. Enclosure took a different direction there, where it forced peasants to continue working the land to provide for the West, struggling to become solvent enough to no longer be dependent on Western manufacturing and become like the core. As the system spread to the New World, Asia, and Africa, Europeans subjugated them using slavery and colonialism to bolster the core and drain the periphery. Europe, in turn, stratified around the merchants who benefited from capitalism the most, as in the bourgeoisie. In order to administer these growing empires, the states had to become more and more bureaucratized. This is what defines modernity for the world system. The world is class stratified with a periphery that provides labor for the core and substantial bureaucracies running each state. That modern world arose during what many historians call the General Crisis, as in the time between the Wars of Religion and the War of Spanish Succession. Power became centralized and people were designated as citizens or not. The system has become more inclusive over time, with revolutions toppling monarchies and reform enfranchising more people in the core, creating a more democratic system. But this is where the world systems theorists get very Marxist and start making predictions. They argue that the political separation of core and periphery masks the rising costs of production, which will eventually surpass the system's ability to handle, leading to a new world revolution and a different system. So that's it. That's the whole of world systems analysis. You can fit so much into this rubric, but it certainly isn't without its detractors and for good reason. Now there's a couple of nonsensical critiques that I should address. First is that of orthodox Marxists who call Wallerstein ultra-Smithian, as though Marx and Smith fundamentally disagreed. They did not. These critics just dogmatically follow one 19th century philosopher as if he is the whole truth, rather than realizing that Marx had many, many flaws that need to be heavily modified to make his examination of capitalism at all useful. Then there's those who are equally dogmatic about scientific positivism, refusing to see the subjectivity of historical truth. The mere mention of theory sets these rubes off. But once again, these are both idiotic takes. For a more substantial critique, look at how world systems analysis is able to explain specifics about its labor system. As one historian says, the more closely we scrutinize the problem of explanation, the more unavoidable is the conclusion that the logic and necessities of the capitalist world system, while important, fail to account for the evolution of labor. The whole theory is too abstract. Labeling who is core or periphery is 
slippery and does not adequately explain history on a human scale. It's the problem of macroeconomics trying to explain culture. One does not easily flow into the other. When you really think about it, world systems analysis basically explains how Europe became hegemonic by saying they became more powerful than other countries. It's a circular answer, not an explanation. Like, think about one of the key parts of what made Europe more powerful. Naval power. How does the world system explain European naval superiority? Or anything military-wise, for that matter? It can't. So while world systems analysis is useful to conceptualize macroeconomics through history, it is not satisfactory as an answer for the question of Western hegemony. Once again, the question remains open. But there are many more answers to examine in possible future episodes. Tell me which one interests you the most. Globalize macro- Come here. Good easy, boy. Oh, thank you. Yes. You're a good boy. Yes. Mwah. <laughs> Whoa! Don't fall. <laughs> don't fall. Hey there. <laughs> He's like, let me go! Let me go! Let me go! Whoa! What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> what are you gonna do about it? You're stuck here.